So yesterday we had that great abseiling trip at the horizontal waterfalls um, and we really wanted to make this place, the Sail River. So we sailed through the night um, to get here. So we've got here at low tide and we're just waiting for the tide to rise and then we can, uh, then we can go up with the rising tide to get into this river. Because what does it say in the sailing guides? It says, exploration of the Sail River has taken place it is not for the faint-hearted, so hopefully we're not faint of heart. So it's 11 miles up um, and it dries all the way in stages, different sandbars. So we're going to have to go when the tide's about 10 metres. All right, today it's going to be close to 11 and a half metres. We've been up here before and on 10 metres I had under my keel about 2.8 about 2.8 was the minimum I had. A lot of time it was deeper, but I noticed that that was the closest we came to dangers last time. So we're going to go just a tiny bit earlier, make sure we can ride the tide up and um, have a good look. And we're going to stay here for a whole tide cycle because there's fresh water up the top and we'll just watch the video and you'll see what's up there. a tough time with our uh, no hitting things with the boat rule in this particular river. Well we made it in just under two hours, pretty good. So we're here at our uh, new home for the next tide cycle, so just over a week. Maybe it's not everyone's cup of tea but it's definitely ours. ranging around remote places like the Kimberley is that we need to have bulk stores of food, things like buckwheat grains and, and wheat grains and millet. So what we do is we they store really well and they don't go off when they're in the seed form and then we mill them down to make flours for breads and cakes and things like that and pancakes which we love. So a good way of keeping the grain stored. Also it takes up less space when you have the grains in seed form. Once they're milled they, the air particles fill more space and also they go rancid quicker so it's best to keep them in grain and then grind, mill them yourselves and you still keep all the nutrients from the seed as well when you grind it, when you mill it fresh. <laughs> So we headed out and it was time to go fishing. We like to go fishing at about one hour to low tide. We find that that's about the best. And we're after Barramundi here, so we're just casting really close to structure and it wasn't very long till we got a good solid barra. Um, but unfortunately, we had a bit of a failure uh, right where the loop knot attaches to the lure. It snapped right in there. It was it wasn't a failure of the knot, it wasn't anything that we could fix, but it doesn't matter because we soon got onto another one. Oh, barrel. Little barrel. Nowhere near as fucking booty as the other one, but he's mm. got some grunt in him.
to work, baby. Yeah. You can belly lift Farrah. And they behave themselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's not going to set records, but it's just enough for the two of us to eat, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's the perfect size barrow for us. <laughs> nice. Little male. How do you know it's male? The size. They oh, turn yeah. female as they get bigger and older. Right. They lose their sense of humour as they get older. <laughs> So Troy is busy ponassing today's catch of barra. We're cooking it over the fire. It's not really ponassing. Well, ponassing inspired, ponass inspired barra. We're cooking barra with no dishes. <laughs> Just some roots to tie the top. Some paper bark skewers to hold them out and some just more paper bark here to as our spits. It's gonna be smoky barra. Mmm, yum. yesterday and set up camp at the end of the, at the rock bar at the Sail River. Probably going to be here for about three days. So I've decided that I'm going to brew some beer today. Yesterday Troy kindly ground down all of the malted barley ready for the brew and we've got a pot of water on the boil ready to start the mash which is where you soak the cracked grains to extract the wort or the the sweet sugars from the grains to make the beer. Pretty exciting, so we'll see how it goes. I normally brew with a group of friends and we have a lot of equipment, but I've had to sort of make up stuff as I go, so I'll show you what I'm doing and we'll hopefully see how it turns out. So I've got a beautiful fresh waterfall here that I'm really excited about brewing with. It's clean water, there's no additives, and it's going to make really delicious. I'm going to be doing the mash, which is the steeping of the grains in hot water in my fermenter because I don't have a specific mash tun for this. So I'll show you what I've done here. In order to stop the grains coming through and blocking up the tap when I'm sparging, I've put a piece of shade cloth type material and then I'm just going to layer rocks over it. These are rocks from the freshwater stream. Here's the grains, the cracked malt, so I'm going to pour that into the uh, fermenter which we're going to use as our mash tun now. I'm putting gloves on so that I can pick up the saucepan without burning myself. I don't have a thermometer with me today, which was a big mistake, but we think that the water is around 75 degrees, so it's ready to put into the mash. Because we want to mash the grains around 60 to 65 degrees. as our mash tun next to the fire to stay warm while we're mashing the grains. I'm collecting water now to boil to rinse off the grains after the mash in a process we call the sparge. I'm about halfway through the mash now and I've got the additional water on ready to rinse those grains off once the mash is complete. I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to get enough wood under there to get the wort itself, once we've rinsed the grains off, to a rolling boil. So we need to have it on a rolling boil for 90 minutes, so I'm hoping it's going to get hot enough to, to make it happen. 
Troy's been pretty busy chopping hardwood for me and putting it under there, so we'll see how it goes. Once the wort had cooled to 22 degrees, it was the right temperature for fermentation, so I added the yeast. So we like to start every day with a coffee. So because we're camping rough here, we don't have our beloved metho stove. We've made just a little suspension set up for our billy, just out of natural materials. So what have we got? We've got the suspension stick. And I've carved the end of it here and put a little divot in the end with a knife. Just put a dimple in there. With this is the actual hook stick that's going to hold the billy. It's going to hold it over the fire. And with that little dimple that I showed there before, I've cut a bunch of sharp little grooves in there. Back cut underneath like a little bird's beak and they actually go into that and then when we put the billy on that cantilever that can't come out of that hole then there's a fork stick back here acting as a fulcrum and a nice big heavy stone to act as a counterweight So while I was making this bit of equipment, we had Pascal, she was off digging up various rocks and smelting them and she made this coffee grinder from scratch because she's just a marble um, and she grew these beans. So that's really great. Let's grind some up. Let's see how Pascal's bush made coffee grinder works. Yeah, it's pretty smooth. So our timing's working out pretty well, just as this is grinding to the final bean, that water's coming to a rolling boil for a bush coffee, that's what you want. So rolling boil, coffee, it's 
straight in. Stir? No stir. The rolling boil handles it. So if it's going to rise up too much, oh look at that, we can move it up the peg. So we want it to boil like that for about a minute. So count to 60,000. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, etc. Or use your watch. Yeah, nice sediment free coffee. going and Troy is prepping out the fish to put on the fire. We've got a couple of mangrove jacks. So we've had a swim and our lunch is ready. Mm, it's fish chips again. Crispy fish chips. Sail River freshwater section of the Sail River and I've just found some art under a ledge and it looks really interesting. I'm gonna go have a look. Here we are in the, the art cave that Pascal found. There's a view that the artist would have enjoyed and we're now enjoying. nests, wasps nests, there's a fig tree growing out of the roof, look at this little colony, this cave is just continuing to be a shelter, awesome. It's like a person.
all the comforts of home, huh? Yeah, water, dragonflies. It's got a multi-level lounge room. Yeah. And a gallery on the roof. Look at what's happened to the grass blowing in the wind. It's incredible. So what have you just found, Pascal? Um, some of our cooking utensils are making fire. <laughs> our stainless steel bowl is reflecting onto the green washing up cloth, the sun. If we take that out of the way. There's smoke. So our stainless bowl, everything just came together. So we've made a parabolic reflector and it nearly set our camp on fire. We just came back in the nick of time. Look at that. Mm. Oh, there's actually a flame there. In there. That is mad. <sighs> Hard. You really you put your finger in it. It's hot. Scorch <laughs> <laughs> oh, the cricket. So, where is the focal point? It's in here. There, right there. Yeah. Should I put the leaf on? Yeah. <laughs> so, Beware of leaving your stainless steel bowls <laughs> in the sun. That's mental. Mm. Where would Madame like to eat? Mm. By the wattle tree? Yes. Excellent. So I put the rug. Bring the rug. This is living. Mm. It's our last day here camping at the Sail River. Choice gone off exploring and fishing. And I've stayed at camp, just been relaxing, doing some yoga, having sleeps, exploring the rainforest and checking on the beer, of course. So I'm just going to make some damper now because I know Troy's going to be back in an hour or so. In here we've got a cup, two cups of flour, two thirds of a cup of milk powder, a big tablespoon of egg powder and two teaspoons of baking powder. So I'm going to add some water to that to get it to a nice consistency ready for the fire. So I think that's a pretty good consistency. Rock out in helicopters.
some head. Yeah. They look like a herring, a giant herring. They're related to mullet. Yeah, right. We checked the tide. It had just reached a high. It was ready for the outgoing and we were going to ride that out to the mouth. So we packed up everything and we said goodbye to our new neighbour, the resident crocodile, and we headed on down the river and out of the sail. We dropped anchor a mile from the mouth of the Sail River because we wanted to go and have a look at the drying sandbars at low tide. The interesting thing about the Sail River is that the sandbars create a lock system so at various stages of the tide it's, you're unable to access parts of the river. Nice yellow tail. Starting to slow down a bit. Well, I think that'll do for dinner, eh? Oh, yeah. glowing red red rubies. <laughs> yeah. You see both his red eyes? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> A mental. Yeah. So we were just sitting here waiting to leave our anchorage when the at the slack tide so we could take the ebb out of this river system. And something very strange has happened with the anchor chain. What we noticed was there was a big crack and the bow of the, the boat started pointing downwards and, and the boat started going down into the, with the rising tide. And then we lost our hook, our snub hook for the anchor chain, so that's gone. And then we've been spending the last hour or so trying to free the chain. The sail's got one last trick for us. Got a whole bunch of current just boiling past those rocks fairly close to us. The anchor chain is fouled on the bottom. Probably under some rocks that look just like that. Uh, where we did lay the anchor is some meters that way, so it might have dragged, caught, and now we're sort of held here. We're waiting for appropriate tide to try and recover our anchor. We don't want to drop the don't want to drop the chain. But it's exciting. Isn't it? It's probably not as dangerous as it looks because that current's rushing by, it's making a pressure wave. So even if we <coughs> broke the anchor and went flying towards those rocks, you'd find that we got swept out past here. I'm just reading about an old navigator that checked out this coast in the 1800s and he <laughs> had lots of bad stuff happening. Foul anchors and swept past rocks by the tide. So the continuing saga 
of the fouled anchor chain. Um, it took an unexpected turn last night when we were using a rope to try and recover the anchor, pull it out, um, and at mid-stage, just during manoeuvring, it went around the propeller. So uh, we re-anchored using the dory to manoeuvre, um, and much to Pascal's anxiety, I just jumped over the side of the mask and snorkel and had to had to clear this clear this rope from the propeller. So now it's covered in blue. I'm covered in blue. The rope's had a little cut to it, but uh, we're free. I didn't get eaten by a crocodile, which is really excellent. We're going to celebrate with pancakes because I'm still alive, um, and we're finally going to get out of here today. Why are you covered in blue? Oh, that's the anti fowl. And. I didn't mention it, did I? No. And also, what happened to the anchor and the anchor chain? Well, the anchor's still at the bottom. <laughs> and it's got some chain attached to it. Um, it got hopelessly fouled around a rock. We tried for hours to get it clear. Um, I think what's happened... And I couldn't... It was smooth bottom on the sander and everything. Uh, when I've sanded over it, what it looks like is just a flat plate of rock. Must have a crack under it. The chain's gone under there and maybe there's a lip or something like that and it's it's snugged in. But that was down in 18 metres in a croc, a croc habitat. So out on the barrier reef, we might have dived down for it, might have free dived down and cleared it because I've done that in the past, but here that's just impossible. Visibility is about 30 centimetres. It would have been pitch black down there and I don't know, a little bit too much for my nerves. So we've let it go and now we're using a hybrid nylon rope and anchor chain, anchor road, which a lot of people swear by anyway. So we've gone into our spare equipment. That's all part of the uh, remote area trouble.